Hello, and welcome to the New York Jewish Film Festival. The festival is presented by the Jewish Museum and Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Aviva Weintraub from the Jewish Museum, and I'm so thrilled to introduce this discussion about the 1939 film, The Light Ahead by Edgar G. Ulmer. And I'm so pleased to have with us Sharon Revo, executive director and co-founder of the National Center for Jewish Film, and Lisa Revo, co-director of the National Center for Jewish Film. We've had the pleasure of collaborating for many years uh, with the New York Jewish Film Festival. And when Lisa told me that there was a possibility that Ulmer's film, The Light Ahead, would be restored in time for this year's New York Jewish Film Festival, I was absolutely excited. And um, the restoration has been done by the National Center for Jewish Film. So first of all, thank you, Sharon and Lisa for the film and for being here today. Thank you for having us. Thanks. So there's a lot to talk about with the film. Maybe we can start out with some background on the director, Edgar G. Ulmer, who's quite well known, uh, mostly for his work in the United States um, and mostly for English language films. So what can you tell us about Edgar G. Ulmer? Uh, Sharon, do you want to talk a little bit about Sure. Ulmer, um, Ulmer um, originally from uh, Austria, born um, outside of Vienna. Um, and uh, came to the States and worked with uh, Max Reinhardt in uh, theater and um, had been uh, both uh, in Hollywood and then back into New York. Uh, got involved with uh, Yiddish theater through uh, his neighbor, um, Hirschbein, um, and who had uh, written the play for Grinefelder. Uh, and that was uh, his first uh, dipping his toe into the Yiddish theater. He actually was not originally a Yiddish speaker himself, uh, but of course he understood enough and they had uh, coaches and uh, obviously he knew the, uh, the milieu. Uh, and uh, with the Artef, which was the um, uh, theatrical um, you know, play group uh, that Hirschbein was involved with. And so uh, Greenfelder was the first uh, in 1937. It was a great success. And this is actually the third Yiddish feature film that Ulmer made uh, in and around New York with the same group. Great, and I understand that Ulmer's wife, Shirley Ulmer, also had an important part in this film. Yes, yeah, she was one of the, uh, I mean, the, the screenplay was actually written by Haver Paver, but with great input from Shirley Ulmer uh, as well, so that, uh, uh, it was uh, based on um, some short stories by um, uh, Mendelo Mochel Skoren, excuse me, get it out there correctly. Uh, and uh, as was an adaptation of these two short stories together with some uh, obviously contemporary kinds of things uh, that uh, Shirley Ulmer uh, was very involved with. Yeah, I would mention as well that um... Ulmer did the set, co did the sets for the film. Uh, he was trained as the set designer and artist. Um, and so the, the mise en scène for the film, which is very much as Sharon, Sharon mentioned, um, uh, draws on his uh, background in, in Europe, in Germany in particular, in Austria. Um, abstract expressionist expression in the film is seen in the sets, in the cinematography, uh, in the lighting. Um, and um, he, Ulmer was in incredibly um, uh, involved with laying out exactly how the film would look and feel. Um, and that is directly based on his work as a, as a practicing artist before he became actually a film director. And I also mentioned that it was actually shot in Newton, New Jersey. Uh, interestingly enough, it was in the, in the same um, property that uh, the prior film, um, Singing Blacksmith, yeah but it was on a property of a, a monastery that was between um, a nudist colony and a Buddhist colony. You're making this up. No, no, but, not. Uh, <laughs> Jim Hoberman. According to Hoberman. Yep, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, um, Jim Hoberman, you'll be speaking with him uh, later in the festival about the film, uh, wrote an extraordinary book based on uh, 
uh, in part uh, records that we have in our films, but also his own incredible research. And he found some fabulous materials on the, on the making of Singing Blacksmith um, and uh, even the bearded um, uh, monastery denizens playing some, uh, some background actors. Um, no nudists, however. And what can you tell us about the exhibition history of the film? And 1939 is a kind of potent year for a film like this to be made. Well, it was uh, after it was made, interestingly enough, it was long lost um, and really had not um, uh, surfaced for a very long time. Our center actually began in 1976 with the acquisition of a privately held collection from the Seiden family. And there were literally pieces of 30 Yiddish feature films, um, by the way, that had been made in four places. The films were made um, in the United States, in Poland, a few in Russia, and a couple in Vienna. Uh, but this was not among them. And so it was one of what we considered one of the lost films uh, until it resurfaced uh, in a collection of a man by the name of Herman Axelbank. Um, and his collection was actually being sold to the Hoover Institute at Stanford, uh, except for this one film that was very different. He actually collected Russian and sort of Eastern European materials. Um, and this was kind of an anomaly within it. And so we acquired uh, that film from that collection before it went to Stanford. Um, and then uh, restored it and uh, premiered it in 1982. Uh, at Lincoln yeah. Center. Uh, yeah. in, um, the in the film was, was one of the most, I mean, we know the Library of Congress has, has documented that um, of independently made films in particular, um, only about half survive, um, particularly, uh, you know, really independent pieces like this. So it was not unusual that the film was lost, but it was one of the more important films that was lost, particularly because it was directed by Ulmer um, and when Sharon and the center acquired the film in the early 80s, um, it was the only surviving uh, film material. Two 35 millimeter, um, as uh, you can tell from looking at the films, they're a little bit beaten up. Uh, they already had subtitles on them, original from the 30s. Uh, so we're stuck with those. We added a few subtitles, but it's not one where we could go back and redo uh, the translation and the subtitles. You're sort of stuck with what you got. Um, but the centers and Sharon's saving of the film in the early 80s means that we have the film today. And the restoration that we just did digitally was based on the work that we did as the film to film. So digital restoration to be able to go back in the same organization with the same people to go back to, to the film from the early 80s um, uh, is, is why we have what we have and what you'll be able to see on the screen. Um, the you film yes. that, that it's shorter than the original. Unfortunately, the materials that we found in the 80s was already missing a big hunk of it. And we're yeah. not really quite sure because we don't even have an original script. Yeah, it's, um, it's a little unclear uh, what's missing, but it all makes sense. I mean, there's nothing uh, problematic in terms of how it unfolds, but we do think that there's some pieces um, that are missing. Um, the, the other fun thing is that the film did premiere after the Center and Sharon restored the film in 1982. Uh, it, it screened at New York Film Festival at Lincoln Center. Um, it was the first Yiddish film to, uh, to screen uh, at the festival and it was a little bit of a hit. It sold, uh, to, it sold out first. There were multiple articles in the New York Times which are really fun to read. Uh, Janet Maslin and other folks wrote about the film. It was a tremendous curiosity, but I think they really liked the film as a film um, and it was such a success that uh, the center put the film uh, at the embassy theater for a couple of weeks in New York, played theatrically uh, and then the folks from the Berlin Film Festival came knocking um, and uh, Sharon took the film to Berlin uh, 40 years after the end of World War II to show a Yiddish film um, in a population that no longer existed um, and to have a standing ovation was uh, an extraordinary uh, thing. I, I would add also about 1939 to circle back um, that 1939, the year of the film, was the height of production of Yiddish films. Um, more films, Yiddish films, feature films were made in 1939 than any other year. Uh, we didn't know what was coming. 
but 1939, uh, it seems very clear, is the demarcation point, sort of a before and after. Uh, while the US didn't enter World War II until a few years later, for Europeans and for Jews in particular, 39 is really the beginning of the war. And it is the, be the before and after, not just for Yiddish film, but for um, Yiddish and Jewish arts more generally and Yiddish and Jewish people more generally. Um, and we even see those artists who were here in the United States making films, making uh, art survived. Those who were abroad um, didn't, many of them. Uh, and so the fact that the film was made here in the States, like some of the other films we have, um, is, uh, it, it, marks that, it marks that moment um, between when the, uh, the, the audience goes, the language goes, um, pretty much everything goes downhill after 1939. And what's I think fascinating about the film is even though it's based on short stories from you know, decades and decades before, um, the sense of um, what's coming is almost, it's almost prescient, it seems to me, both as a selection of a piece, uh, whether it's the, um, uh, the feeling of doom, um, the conflicts that it shows for um, um, sort of, uh, and kind of ironically, and now we're talking, you know, uh, 2021, 40 years later, 30, 40 years later, um, that uh, the issues that it raises having to do with uh, uh, pandemics, uh, with respect for science, uh, with um, uh, sort of though the conflict between um, ignorance and um, um, greed versus a sort of ethical behavior, all of those kinds of issues that uh, are very, very present today um, are themes actually um, in the film itself. Right, so one of the um, elements that makes the film so powerful today, of course, is that it's set um, during the cholera epidemic. And so just to clarify, the film was made in the US in 1939, but the story is set in a shtetl, a town outside of Odessa um, in 1918, right? The cholera epidemic. Um, and it's, it, it really does um, form the backdrop for a lot of the action and a lot of the discussions, um, including a very kind of stark and um, uh, powerful scene of a cholera wedding, also known as a plague wedding. Can you talk about that scene a little bit? Yeah, I think, um... Especially in the 19th century, there was um, a superstition that beyond weddings, actually, but the idea that the cemetery holds a, um, it, it's a liminal space between the living and the dead. And so even in the film Beyond the Wedding, which I, I will uh, mention, uh, at one point you have a mother of a, of a sick child and she goes to the, to the cemetery and she holds onto the grave and she begs her mother for the health of her child. And so the idea that the living would appeal to the dead to act on their behalf um, goes beyond the idea of a plague wedding. But the plague wedding in particular, um, the idea would be that you, had, you would take the two poorest people, um, if they're orphans, all the better, but um, the two poorest, um, most disenfranchised people, um, bring them together, have the cemetery as the, the locus of this good event, and that uh, there would be almost a trade uh, for happiness um, versus death. Um, and um, we have a prologue that we put at the film that David Roskies, the wonderful David Roskies wrote, which um, uh, we put at the beginning of the film. And he writes really lyrically about the film as a, as a, a study of contrasts. And we see that throughout the film, that the film is about um, uh, good and evil and religion is shown not purely as a, um, you know, without consequence, bad consequence, good consequence. Um, it's a complex look, but through contrast. Um, and so um, in thinking about what David wrote all those years ago, I was thinking about the film, particularly in light of the, what we we're talking about before and the mise-en-scene and how it's laid out. And the film is very much about light and dark 
And you see that in the, in the scenes at the wedding, the happiness and sadness, the love between um, our uh, blind girl and our lame boy. Um, they're always laughing and crying together. Love for them is laughing, but it's also crying. But the light that you see in the film, light and dark, um, we can, I can tell you in trying to do the restoration of the film, the shooting in the night and the nighttime scenes, it's bloody well difficult to try and bring back, I can tell you. Um, but the literalness of starting the film in the light and ending the film in the light, you're in exteriors and throughout the film and the difficulties of um, disease and um, uh, entrenched um, poverty, all of the darkness is shot in darkness. Um, and so the film really is, it's, it's quite a brilliant film in its way. Um, in the love scene between the two of them talking, it's at night and she says, look, it's the moon. The moon lights up the darkness. And so as you watch the film and you see these meditations back and forth, and sometimes they're quite literal um, with, with Mendela standing at the window and begging God to, um, why has he forsaken? Um, and then the, the, the town citizens at one point get together and they say, why have the leaders forsaken? And um, why, why superstition over science? Um, it all plays out in how the film reads and how it, how it looks, I think. And watching it this many times doing our little digital restoration <laughs> the last, I was surprised at how well um, it deals with these um, these complex themes all these many years later. Uh, uh, let me just add that I think the performances are really um, quite extraordinary. These are um, some seasoned actors from the Yiddish stage. Um, Ulmer, uh, as a director, uh, of course, this is the, the third of the Yiddish, but he's made a whole bunch of films before this. It's really both from an artistic standpoint standpoint and from an acting standpoint, I think really one of the highlights. I mean, Isidore Kashir's performance as Bendel Mokhlesworm is just, as the Bendel character is just, uh, at least to me, uh, amazing. Um, Helen Beverly um, uh, was uh, uh, at one point married to Lee J. Cobb um, and uh, she uh, had been in a couple of uh, Yiddish films before. Um, and uh, David Apatashu, he's a young 19 year old um, and uh, of course goes on to um, quite um, uh, important uh, Hollywood actor. He's uh, in Exodus, he's the Irgun leader for those uh, who uh, uh, are uh, fans of the, the Exodus film from the 60s. Um, so um, a wonderful opportunity to see some of these um, Yiddish actors, uh, all of whom, by the way, um, spoke English as well. Uh, but um, it, it, the person who didn't speak English, uh, Yiddish so well was uh, Edgar Ulmer. Uh, so he had Jacob Ben-Ami sort of as his coach, um, even though he was European born, he didn't, um, you know, it wasn't his first language by any means. Uh, so that uh, um, it's, uh, as Lisa says, you're 1939, uh, sort of on, on the precipice of what, who could possibly have imagined, but at the same time, it has the, the tom, the feel for um, kind of what's coming, it seems to me. And for us today, I mean, yep. as they yep. said, the call out to God when Mendel says, how can you remain silent in the face of thousands of years of misery and size? Um, how can, when will the torture end? I mean, this is, this is how we feel now, but also conversely, the call to the leaders as we are um, um, about to have a new inauguration and uh, troubles of our own, um, when they call out, man must not remain silent. Curses, cursed be to he who sees wrongs and is silent. Cursed be to the coward who fears to speak the truth, who shuts his ears to the screams, the groans of the unfortunate, the insulted, the needy. Cursed be they whose conscience, who sells his conscience for a price, who have the power to help with a word. Um, I think nothing could be more um, of its time uh, than this um, somewhat strange document from 1939, honestly. It, it certainly is a film that calls out for the, um, that advocates for um, the poor and disenfranchised and uh, the need to, for humanity to kind of open its heart to um, people that might be 
or might feel that they're relegated to the fringes. Yes, and the structural nature of it, um, which is um, unique really to this film, this script, that the, um, the shtetl is seen as a complex um, ecosystem of its own. Um, and it's not purely evil, although there are evil folks, but the structure is the problem. So you have the leaders who are, have a thousand ruble, a hundred thousand rubles that they're playing with. Um, they're using it for themselves, but they're using it through the prayer service, through through their own little, you know, uh, organizations, their own fiefdoms, um, and it this the, the poverty is structural. Um, you can't. There's no way to uh, to rise up, and it's all through begging. You know, who begs, who doesn't beg, who pretends to be uh, sicker than they are in order to get more money for begging. Um, that, that's no way to run a society. You, can, you have to have some kind of a social net, you know, safety net. You just, begging is not a, is, so, so I think to show it is one thing, but to, to show that the, uh, the societal structure is the problem is really what is um, at least politically. So um, I wouldn't say radical, but um, quite different than the other films that don't um, uh, take a look at the underpinnings in the way that this film uh, might. Um, don't you think, Sharon? Yeah, and I think it's, you know, um, interesting. I mean, it, it's a critique of the society in so many ways. It is a critique of religion, but at the same time, there's also some hope within those that are, behave ethically, um, you know, within it. So that it's, as you say, it's got the good and the bad. It's got the light and the dark. Um, of course, it's black and white, but it's still, um, as Lisa said, it starts in light and it ends in light, and so we won't give it away. But um, it's um, those two sort of the, the opening and the closing uh, yeah. have, uh, I think, a sense of hope uh, for yeah. uh, which uh, hopefully uh, <clears throat> we will all have also here uh, uh, in uh, 2021. Can only hope. Can only hope. Um, I, I wanted. To, I was thinking about something else too when I was talking about the the set. There's a marvelous um, at an angle lamppost, which appears in several films, uh, and it's as yes, scenes, seen. and it's uh, and it's called out by the actors. With a lamplighter comes in, it's at an angle, which is this marvelous, um, you know, right out of the drawings for the film. You can see because we've seen the original uh, set drawings, and um, and when David Apatashu says goodnight to his beloved, and he hit, hits his hat up. And he has this look on his face and he spins around and he holds the, uh, he bumps into, but then holds on to this crooked lamppost, which is our light in the darkness. Um, and I thought, how many years after was singing in the, in the rain? Of course, I had to look it up. So it was 13 years uh, before um, Gene Kelly grabs his, uh, you know, lamppost and dances around it. And so uh, um, here we have the Yiddish film, um, uh, before Gene Kelly. <laughs> oh, that's great. It, yeah. I was thinking it's like a combination of singing in the rain and the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Yes, with the... <laughs> absolutely. Yes, though that scene is marvelous. And we really had uh, quite a lot of trouble with the restoration trying to, um, you know, it's a trade off now with the digital, it allows you to um, have a little bit more pixels to work with. Um, but folks will see, you know, it's a little bit of a trade off. Um, get more detail by allowing more light, um, but um, it shows the imperfections of the original production, which was pretty low budget, and also the materials that you have. As I said before, you've got what you got. Um, and so um, it, it's of interest to us. I don't know if it is interest to other people, but we found those scenes to be, that particular scene was quite, uh, uh, we had to go back many times to try and play with it to get the best we could. One other footnote about the, the restoration, um, as Lisa said, you know, we were um, using, um, you know, the materials, there were just two extant prints that we did the original restoration from, and the subtitles were already on it, uh, and we were able to add a few, but um, it's not, not every word literally is translated, so people may be a little frustrated that they don't understand, you know, some of the not so significant things that are actually going on within the scenes, but there was nothing more that we could actually do. As I say, we had added some 
subtitles so to to make it as um you know sometimes you can tuck them in non yiddish speaking audience but it is what it is and also yeah. the subtitles are a little skewed but again you know there's only so much you can do even in the digital age of uh of cleaning it up and, and making it presentable. But, uh, and there's a few really wonderful scenes to look for. Um, uh, there's a wonderful scene where three people are eating out of the same uh, soup pot on Shabbos, um, which is- Which in the days of COVID, everybody eating out of the same pot will uh, uh, really hit you in a way that they never intended. Um, uh, one, they all have their one spoon, uh, um, but it's, uh, the other thing I would say about the um, uh, thing to look look out for is um, the there's a, there's some humor in the film, and I, I think it's remarkable that using such dark subject matter that they're able to find some um, funny little uh, funny little moments, and I think that speaks to the original stories as well, which are which are which really have a lot of uh, funny parts, um, and. These were pretty sophisticated films for independently made um, uh, films at the time. And, and maybe partly that's why we find in, in, these, uh, in these Yiddish films that they, you know, you don't have a studio system. You, these are, you, you know, you make what you wanna make. Um, sometimes they're based on a play. So you're most of the time based on a play. So you're tied to that. Here, this is original. They were able to do whatever they wanted. Um, and so sometimes you find it more unique pieces in these really independently made films than you do with things that um, were answering to more people. Um, here they're just answering to their own interests. You mentioned um, Jim Hoberman before. He of course wrote the very, very important book, Bridge of Light, Yiddish Film Between Two Worlds. And I'll just um, mention the, oh, look at that. <laughs> there you go which we republished uh, with uh, University Press New England, Brandeis University Press, we republished a couple years ago. And it, it has a, uh, an afterword about what happened. This was done for the uh, retrospective that was done at the Museum of Modern Art in 1991, uh, and it ha but it has an afterword in the new republication about what happened since 1991 to the Yiddish films. Oh, so we, I interrupted you, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, that was perfect. And I was just going to say that um, Jim Hoberman will be in conversation with Film at Lincoln Center's Dan Sullivan on January 26 at 6 p.m. It's a special event program for members of Film at Lincoln Center and the Jewish Museum. Well, before we wrap up, do you want to give the URL of the center or? Sure. Uh, we have um, about 300 films available and a good number of those are Yiddish films. Uh, so you visit us at jewishfilm.org, easy to remember. Um, and you can write to us if you have any, any questions. Um, Ulmer made four Yiddish films. We have all four of those and um, uh, uh, lots of other interesting uh, pieces as well. Most Wonderful. of which have screened at New York Jewish Film Festival and they, we premiere every year our new restoration with the, with the a, festival. A great tradition. Well, thank you so much for this conversation and for your, your great work on the film. It's been thank a joy, you. honestly. Yes, and for showing the film again at a very uh, uh, important time. Yeah, we should only be together in, in real life next year. Amen. Amen. Great, thanks. Be well. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>